Hello everybody, welcome back to this series where I cover my campaign of Curse of Strahd for Shadow Dark. Um, this is going to be part 8, I suppose. Um, we played a couple days ago, and it was a really interesting session. We played for about three hours, and it wasn't the sort of... I mean, it had a bit of a sort of climax, the sort of towards the whole season I was expecting, but they didn't do exactly what I thought, which, you know, who, who's ever going to do exactly what you thought? think. And I had to kind of, you know, um, kind of think on my feet a bit. Plus, it was kind of a, a, a weird energy session. So one of my players had a really bad headache, I think, throughout the entirety of the thing. Um, she had a hard day of work, and she was like, I want to play, but... So she was kind of out of it, and she's usually one of the big role players and, like, the big drivers. And then another one of my players had been sick all weekend, and he was recovering, and so he was kind of low energy as well. Um, so, and, and then the other character, the one who's usually kind of takes more of a backseat, he he stepped forward a bit and, and kind of filled the gap that the other two players had been leaving in their role-playing and stuff. But he's also the one who's, like, really silly. Not silly, but he plays his character a bit more like, yeah. So the tone was really different this last session. And so I found it to be a little less fun than, and I think that, um, you know, I don't know how my players felt about it. I think a couple of them enjoyed it, but they were, I think they all enjoyed it, but they were all, um, not all, but they were having kind of a, an off day, you know, and that happens obviously in D and D. Um, and, and there was a time constraint too, because one of my players was like, I really need to get to bed at a certain time. Like I need to quit. And so I had to kind of, um, move things along in a way that I think felt pretty artificial at a couple points. It was fine. Uh, it was good. It was a totally solid session, and I think afterwards everyone enjoyed it, and they're interested in playing another one, um, even though I thought kind of this would be the climax, and then we would have a... You know, but I think that at least we'll have one more session. But the way that the campaign is going, I think a lot of my whole arc towards, like, Velaki and Kresik and all that stuff, I think I'm going to try to... Well, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if in a couple sessions one of my players says, hey, you know, I just can't keep making this game. And he drops. I think I'll continue with the three players. But um, one player is just, I, he's enjoying it. I think he's having fun. But he's the one who's been missing a bunch of sessions. I don't think it's a high priority for him to make it, and especially compared to the other players and their interest in the story and stuff and the interest in the campaign. He's run through Curse of Strahd before. He knows the whole overall thing so it's not as it's not much of a draw to him uh, the other players haven't done it so they're more interested to see what's happening and what this land is like and stuff so anyway we'll see um i think i'll still keep playing and i think at least three of my players will keep playing the fourth might um he said he the, the character that he's been playing he's usually a really heavy role player he's usually really um plays charismatic characters and this time he intentionally chose a character who would be a bit more of a back seat because he he tends to play players who kind of take take charge and so he intentionally picked a character who was a little bit off type, who was more of a, a quiet, you know, combat type. He's the guy who's playing the beast, but that's not his preference, and so he's not having as much fun <laughs> with that character. And I think he said this last session that the character is starting to grow on him. Uh, but you know, that's not a. We've been playing for eight sessions, and now the character is finally starting to grow on him. So he's clearly not as interested in the guy as as he otherwise would be in playing another character. So anyway, um, we'll see. It's a lot of preamble. So it. Remember, in if you guys have watched part seven, you'll know that uh, Irina had run off. Basically, <laughs> she ran off and um, didn't. Uh, in the middle of the in the morning, she left into the mist and left Barovia behind. And so the players had been in the church; they had been doing other things. They'd killed Father Donovich, um, and then they had uh, they had left and they had gone uh, to try to chase after Irina. So she had a couple hours head start on them. So they were, again, a couple hours behind her. They went through the um, they went through the wood. They were tracking her, trying to track her, but they couldn't really track her. They rolled really badly on their tracking, but they knew that her destination was this air pool camp. They knew it was on the river, so they were like, well, we'll just follow the river west into the woods, and eventually we'll find it, right? So they did. Now, um, as they were going, I picked some of my encounters um, that I had on my random encounter list. Let's see if I can find that. Um, here, encounters. I'll bring this over. Um, and, uh, yeah. So I picked, um, I picked this, the pair of women offering in the woods. Um, and then I picked uh, an ancient rod of tree snaps. So I picked just two of them. I didn't roll. Um, 
I just decided, you know, I'm going to pick these two because they really want to find Irina. I don't want to give them something that, like, leads them off course, but I also want to give them, like, a sense of something else happening out here. So I said that across the river, because they're on the south side of the river, across the river somewhere in the wood, they could hear women singing, like a whole group of women singing. And I, I decided that, you know, Anika and Tarina are meeting, like, a coven out there or something like that. So they went to do it. They have been missing for a couple days now. They've been doing this long ritual in preparation for the return of Strahd. That's kind of the idea. So they heard this singing across the river. Um, and they were like, well, it's interesting, curious, but I'm not going to go that way. We have to find Irina. Let's continue on. So they continued on and they ignored it. Then I had this, I had everyone roll off. And whoever rolled the lowest dex, check. I should have done, and I realized this, I should have done perception check. Because then, like, someone leans against it or something and it collapses. But as it was, I just had them roll dex checks, and whoever rolled the lowest then had this. So they had to roll two dex checks in a row. Uh, it was kind of lame. I should have had it do one or the other. So uh, the tree snapped and fell towards the PC. He succeeded. He rolled his uh, dex, and so I think he, he managed to avoid the tree falling on him. They did an examination of it, and uh, I said that they found these claw marks, that this has been, like, a, a, a regularly and over time has been clawed at. And then I said that there's a trail. They found a trail that leads due south from it. So the trail that kind of goes west and then south, like directly south, like from the tree. So they were like, okay, so it's a, it's a marker. Like this is as far as you go along the river, you hit the tree that's marked like this, and then you go due south. So they'd realize, okay, something, there's something due south of us. But once again, do, do we think that this relates to the creature that was chasing after Irina? Do we think Irina went south? here and they're like no probably not we don't have enough reason to suspect that she would find this or that she did so let's continue towards the camp so they did they left it behind um it would have been interesting had they followed it because they would have gone to the cabin and they would have found arena there <laughs> but um they found her well i'll come back to that they found her eventually they went to the, so they went west and they found the vistani camp and here is where um the energy of the session really affected the session it was already kind of i could tell like one of the players was definitely trying the one who had been sick and was trying to like put it in. He had, he was trying to be interested and I could tell he was very tired and was like making an effort, you know, and I appreciate that, but it was clear this wasn't like naturally drawing him in so far. And, um, the, uh, the other player was just kind of like, you know, she was out of it. Uh, she was trying to listen. She was trying to, she was asking like, what, sorry, what did you guys say again? Um, and she was apologizing, but it was just like, you know, she was, she was definitely out of it. Um, and so really it was two players and they kind of had this awkward back and forth role playing where the one silly character was being really silly and the other character was trying to be a bit more serious and take him. And it was just kind of like an odd, it was an odd beginning to a session. And so when they finally got to the Vistani camp, it was already, he'd already kind of started, at least from my perspective, on a bit of an off foot. Um, so the players, um, they decided to go into camp and like talk and they all stuck together and really they just kind of went, I described there were some people playing cards, there were some people playing music, there were some people sitting around talking. Uh, the sense of everybody was kind of ill at ease and everyone was um, like, like, they recognized that they were there, they were unhappy that they were there, but they weren't gonna do anything. They didn't approach them, they didn't stop them. And I think that was a mistake. I should have had them see a bunch of different things to do. Like I should have mentioned there was a merchant, I should have mentioned that there was, um, because eventually they did see um, Mirabel and um, Alenka, who were the two Vistani sisters who survived from Barovia who had gone here. Uh, they did, did eventually see them. So I should have said, you see them at their tent. You see the leader of the camp or the guy who seems to be in charge giving some orders by the, and you see the big tent with a couple guards nearby. You see some people gambling. You see them, like I should have done that, right? I should have said, here's the whole thing, a whole bunch of choices. What do you want to interact with? Instead, I just described the camp generally, the, the mood of the camp, and I gave them the people gambling and I told them about the guy standing in front of the big tent with a few people. So they were like, okay, well, we have one choice, really, right? We have one choice in, to go talk to him. And I, I was like, that's a mistake. I should, have, I should have given them multiple options that would have allowed them access to the camp or access to information. Instead, they felt like, well, either we can go gamble, and that's one way, I guess, but none of them were really interested. One character was interested in that, but he didn't end up doing it. And then the rest of the characters were like, well, I guess we just go and talk to the guy that's what we're supposed to do. And, and that was just, uh, was just my, it was a bad description on my part. So that, that also put me kind of in a, like, ugh, dang it. Um, and so they started talking to him, and he basically tried to pass them off to this other Vistani lady as quickly as he could. He was like, yeah, we're busy. Go talk to her if you're interested. Because they're like, well, we kind of want information. We want to know. And he was like, no, I haven't seen anybody. Sorry, no one's come through. 
And they were like, well, we don't know about that. <laughs> so then they split at that point. Um, um, the two characters, it was kind of funny, the two characters were sort of out of it. <laughs> they went and they found Alenka and Mirabelle and they talked to her. The one kind of silly character went and talked to the, the historian or the Vistani lady who was willing to tell kind of stuff about about the history, about what's going on. And then um, the, the other player who was who was kind of, you know, into it more, he, he stayed with the, the um, uh, who you know, ended up being Uncle Stanimir, or just Stanimir, um, the big guy who's kind of quasi sort of in charge now that Madame Eva's in her trance. So um, the, 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 I kind of went between groups and it was, it was again, <clears throat> just a matter of, of timing and of interest and it was kind of hard to do. So one player was uh, the, the, the kind of silly player who had the opportunity to ask a lot of information. He didn't, he didn't ask anything really seriously. Um, he didn't really know what to, what would be helpful for them to know and he didn't really approach it in that frame of mind and so he didn't end up getting anything from her that was useful. And he kind of made it into a funny moment again, because he always does this. Um, and uh, and so the party was kind of frustrated at him because it was an opportunity to learn stuff and he didn't take it. He just used his opportunity to be kind of silly. And I tried to pass some information that way, but it was clear he wasn't going to engage with it. So I was like, all right, well, he's not interested in, in that. He's just interested in kind of having a funny scene. And so I played it that way. And then the... Um, the uh, the two who wandered off, they went into Alenka and Mirabelle. And, and this is where I was like, okay, I got to give them some information. <laughs> Why would Alenka and Mirabelle have this information? They're outsiders, sort of. They're only half Fistani. They're allowed into the camp because their uncle is, uh, is Stanimir. So they, they know him. But they've gotten here and they've probably been told that bad stuff is going on. So um, I think it worked, but it was, it was really expository. Like, here's a bunch of information. And, uh, and the players, I think one of them really appreciated it. The other one was kind of like, mm, I, yeah, I get what you're doing here. <laughs> um, because a lot of this information would have come from the other conversation, but he wasn't playing it that way. So essentially, I had them jumping back and forth, the two sisters, um, Mirabelle being more serious and um, asking for confirmation. Because they knew that Sorvia had been killed and they knew what killed her, but Mirabelle wasn't as convinced that it was possible as Alenka, but once the player said, yeah, she woke up and we killed her, basically, we, we slew her at her form, she's at peace now, she was like, okay, then this is all real, really happening. This is really happening. Alenka was already convinced of it, but Mirabelle was like, okay. And basically, they both said, you got to get out of here, because by tonight, you won't be able to leave. After tonight, you won't be able to leave. And I've realized something. So um, the ritual that is being conducted in the castle isn't necessarily you bring Strahd back entirely. For that, they need the book. What it is, is it's a, it's a way to bring his spirit back to the land to make him um, sort of quasi there. And that will seal off Barovia so that he can then come to his full power. So that's what the, the mists at that point will start to become poisonous and will lock you into the land. And that, at that point, no one will be able to leave. So um, that's why they're, they're like, get out of here. The only people who will be able to leave are the Vistani. And you're not Vistani, so you got to get out of here right now. If you can possibly make it to the borders of Barovia, do it. And the players are like, well, we're not going to do that. One of the players was like, we could. We could just try to steal a horse or something and, and like steal horses and ride out of here by the end of the night. And the others are like, well, yeah, we could do that. If we do that, the adventure's over. But also, um, stuff will still be happening here. We'll just not be able to affect it. So they're like, all right, well, we'll stay. And so then they talked about things, and they realized, they, they said, okay, the, the Vistani are aware that, that this night... Uh, basically, they, they found out that there are factions within the Vistani and that Madame Eva, who was sort of in charge, or at least she had the, the moral authority over the Vistani, she's been put into this trance, and the, and Elenka suspects they did it to her. Whoever they are, the, the people who are bringing the devil back, they did this to her so that the Vistani would side with them. And there are several other Vistani who are powerful, including um, Luvash, who is a werewolf. And he and several others that he has turned are basically the, the brute force um, that are forcing the Vistani to to either be neutral or, or to side with the cult and with, with Strahd. And so Uncle Stanimir made something similar in his conversation to uh, Ulysses, who was talking to him. And Stanimir basically said something like, look, I, it's not that I'm not sympathetic with you. You seem like a very good person, a very nice person. <laughs> um, I don't approve of what we have done. But if I say anything, I'm dead, and then uh, that won't do any good. Um, so 
you get out of here basically because you're just going to cause trouble and, and we can't do anything about this. Without, without Madame Eva, we can't do anything. And so they found out that Madame Eva has been in this trance and therefore Stanimir's technically in charge of some people, but there's this faction of werewolves essentially and the people who support them that want, <clears throat> want, the, want the devil's return, want Strahd's return, and so they're the ones kind of keeping everybody in line, in line with that. Um, and they found out that Irina had come into town and that she had demanded to see the dogs. Where are the dogs? You know, basically. And so she, she made people immediately mad and they had attacked her and beaten her and had dragged her off. And they were like, we don't know where she is. But we know that she was, she was here and she has been captured by the wolves, the werewolves. Also, there are people in black robes who are up at the castle conducting a ritual to bring this guy back. By tonight it will be done, and they have talked, they have been to camp this morning. I saw one of them here in camp. So they know that, okay, that the Vistani have some connection then with the castle, the ruin, and with, uh, with what's going on there. Um, so then uh, they were like, well, this is really hopeless. <laughs> no one here is helping us. No one here. What do we, we don't even know where she is. What do we do? And so uh, Stanimir basically said, hey, um, before you leave, ask my cousin Ratka for some wine. Buy some wine from him. And they were like, all right. And so uh, he goes over to Ratka, who I had had. He has been bit by a werewolf, and he's terrified of Luvash, but he's kind of actually not. I had, I had thought of him as sort of like a, a sycophantic a, you know, toady who was scared into service, but he was serving the bad guys. I realized that's not actually um, the way I want to play him. I wanted to play him a bit, a bit more of like a roguish hero kind of guy um, who is is has been bit by a werewolf and now will probably turn. But um, who's been bit? I didn't. They didn't specify with by what. But he is he is on the side of Uncle Stanimir and he's on the side of of the good Vistani, those who are trying to break free. So uh, Ulysses went to talk to him and he was like, "Hey." Uh, so uh, he's like, your, your your cousin told me to buy some wine from you. And he's like, oh, okay, I come into my tent. And there's a wine everywhere. And he's like, so what do you think, a Barovian vintage, like 19 years old or so, 20 years old? And he was like, ah, I gotcha. Right? And he's obviously talking about Irene. He's like, actually, we don't have that here, but we do have it stored nearby. I can I can tell you where it is if you want to go there. you got to watch out for the guard dog, though. Um, and they were like, oh, okay, gotcha. This guy's cool. So they liked Rodka. They actually thought one of the um, one of the players was like, he's the best NPC we've met, met, met so far. Because he was clever, he was like helpful. Um, he seemed like he was a genuinely good guy. And then when he shook his hand, he saw the bite mark, um, and they were like, "Oh man, poor guy." So they really liked Rotka, and they wanted to kind of go back and get him later. But at the moment, um, I, I'm glad that there's a character like that because so far, one of the pro one of the problems they've had is they're like, "There's no one here in Barovia except us who is heroic. There's no one here who's willing to do anything who isn't like a, a terrified peasant." And, and that's sort of true. I mean, Irina is willing to do stuff, but she's not terribly effective at it. Um, Ismark is kind of um, not useless, <laughs> but he's uh, definitely in over his head. And uh, and then they got here to the Vistani, and most of them are terrified and unwilling to oppose these people. So Rodka, they're like, okay, there's finally some guy who's willing to do something with us. Um, and so they uh, I, they basically went to... Um, and I have the... Uh, this is the uh, the art that I used for, for the various characters. So I had... Uh, um, Rodka's this guy, um, and I, I I like him. Uh, he's kind of roguish and kind of like uh, you know he looks kind of like a, I don't know some sort of dashing figure, um, and that's that's the art I used for him. And they they were like, okay, yeah, this guy's cool. Um, they like they liked him, and it's funny because that's just not how I intended him to be. Now this was the art I used for Uncle Stanimir, and uh, so he was just you know talking to them uh, basically the whole time. Um. And then uh, I think Grillshaw, she was the one who was talking to um, to Arthur for a while, was the character. This is the art I used for her. And she was very flirtatious with him and was trying to, uh, but she's not terribly good. She's just uh, kind of there to distract and to, uh, you know, <laughs> that's basically her job is to distract outsiders. Um, but she knew stuff. She knew some things. And so if he had talked to her, if he'd been serious about that, because she could have gotten, could have gotten information from her, but he didn't really. Um... And so basically they, they followed the Ratka's directions. Oh, and before he left, he said, here are some spices you'll want to add uh, to that to that vintage. Or you'll want to you use these spices with the next thing that you, uh, you go into. And he handed them a, a bag with a couple bullets in it. They were silver bullets, four silver bullets. And uh, so they were like, okay, wow, so this guy's really helpful. 
Um, now, the, the silver bullets really only help Arthur because everyone else has a way of doing magic damage. Um, but but uh, Arthur is a rogue or a thief, and he has no way of hurting vampires or werewolves. Um, he has no way of hurting them, uh, even though he and he can sneak attack for massive damage. But it's all it's all zero against anything. And so he the fact that he has four silver bullets now three left after the fight. I'll tell you about that. But um, but it really matters. So they have these three bullets. Um, so they left. They were followed by this guy. Uh, I, it was going to be Zolt who was going to be following them. Um, and Zolt, I decided, is actually working for um, Luvash. And they, uh, but they, uh, they um, scared him away as he was following them into the woods. And then, basically, the um, they they went to the uh, cabin. They found the the cabin, and I drew them drew them a sort of a map of the cabin. I added a bunch of windows that aren't on this map, and I took away from this back door. I probably should have just used this map, um, and it would have worked better than how it worked out. Um, well, it worked out fine, but the, so this was, we were, we were coming up on like two and a half hours of play at this point, and one of my players had said he kind of wanted to be done at three hours. Like he was like, I kind of need to be done at that point. And so we had half an hour left and I really wanted it to be kind of a, they had been waiting and he wanted to get into a fight. I knew he wanted to. Um, he kind of has this blood, <laughs> this blood lust that kicks in and uh, he's like, I got to get into a fight sometime. So he was definitely interested in, in getting into a fight. And so I just used... Basically, I just used the Barovia encounter, but I was like, well, this is going to be too hard to run. Uh, and when I say Barovia encounter, what I mean is this. Um, I had created this um, cult attack on Barovia, um, and I had had a cultist with the vampires, and then a bunch of thugs, a bunch of zombies, a couple ghouls, and a bunch of wolves, and then Luvash. So it was a big fight, and it was going to be the attack on the, the town with a whole bunch more, and I realized, okay, there's going to be a bunch more uh, thugs and, and zombies and stuff in the town elsewhere, and they can, they can have waves that can come help reinforce during the fight. Well, for here, I just wanted them to be in this cabin, and I thought, well, I can't have all of that just hanging out in the cabin. What I should have done is had the wolves outside um, with some, you know, uh, some of the thugs, and then I should have had things inside. But again, it was like, I, I was kind of, um, well, it was the downside of me switching up my plans on the fly. And so I was like, all right, well, I'm going to have the cultist in there. I'm going to have not Luvash, but a werewolf in there. And I'm going to have a bunch of thugs. So I had eight thugs. And I'm going to have uh, I'm going to have all the zombies. But I'm going to take out the wolves and the ghouls. And there's no waves. And, of course, there's no vampires. So it was a way weaker fight than I had initially been envisioning for this kind of climactic fight. Um, and the players had the drop on them. Now, again, there was a werewolf in there. Why didn't he smell them approaching? <laughs> Why didn't... Again, there were these things that I was like, okay, this is really convenient that he doesn't smell them at all or that... But I described how there was a really thick, uh, strong, strong stench from the zombies and, and maybe that was it, right? So, all right. So the players knew what was in there. They they spied through the window and they, they stealthed up and they spied through the window and they saw what was in there. And they saw that Irina wasn't in that room. She was in the back room. So... They, just, they had kind of had a plan to break in through all the windows at the same time, and the one guy saw Irina in the back. And before he could warn everybody else, the plan started to go. So Arthur wasn't actually in the fight for the first few rounds. It was just Ulysses, uh, Varya, and Pavel. So Varya comes in through the back door, Pavel and Ulysses um, come in through the front door, or she comes in through the back window, and they come through the front door. And so they go into this attack. In the first round... Um, <laughs> Ulysses casts Turn Undead, and the he doesn't even roll that high. He rolls like a 12 or something like that to cast it. But I rolled like, because zombies have a minus 3 charisma, I rolled like 1, 2, and 3. or It was, it was like ridiculous. My rolls were terrible for them. And so well, most of them just immediately were, were incinerated. So the zombies were gone. There was one who survived, and he was turned. He wasn't destroyed, but he was turned, so he hid in the corner. But the rest were just gone, and so that was a huge chunk of the fight just out. I should have considered that when I was... the possibility of that when I was just putting this together quickly, because, like, turn undead is powerful in this. Um, and especially when they're destroyed. So, um, a bunch of them were destroyed. And that made the, the threat of the fight way lower. Then, um, because they all have magic damage now the werewolf actually isn't that strong. And I'm trying to run them by the book. So um, he only has like 20-some hit points, 24 hit points or something like that. 
Now, normally that's still pretty strong, but they were focusing fire. And so that's going to take him down quick. So what happened was essentially they broke in, they had a surprise round, they did uh, a bunch of damage, they turned a bunch of undead, and then they got another round of initiative off and they won. And so Varya jumps in and slashes uh, the werewolf on the back and uh, um, Pavel slashes him with his claws and he turned into the beast again because he took a bunch of damage on the werewolf's turn. So he was the werewolf too and the beast and the werewolf were fighting and uh, the cultist got taken off with a couple quick hits into the crit. I think he got... His, his head cut off, so that was it. And that was also sort of anticlimactic because the cultist was Ari and I had changed him to um, the guy who had recruited Pavel into the cult in the first place. He added this guy in his backstory, and I said, well, yeah, he's he's there. Why not why not make him a person that he knows? And so I, I thought it was kind of an interesting thing. But he killed him in like two rounds, and he was not interested in him. He was like, oh, yeah, that's that guy. Okay, cool. And again, if it had been a different character or if he'd been in more of the mood or it might have been a different moment, but it was a combination of the fact that he was tired um, that he was actually playing past the point he had said he wanted to play, so he was really tired, and he was kind of frustrated at that, and he was just like, yeah, whatever, cool, cool. Um, you know, it happens. I'm not, not blaming anybody, but it was just, it was definitely an anticlimax. It was an anticlimax. Um, and then, he wanted this kind of really cool moment where he fought a werewolf. And I, I agree, it would have been awesome. And so he was like, I'm going to go, I'm going to fight this thing. And so he and the werewolf were going toe-to-toe, -to -toe and they were slashing at each other. And cool. Varya jumped up behind and slashed him, and... Um, the crossbowmen were, were because of the, the thugs were crossbowmen, I, I think I only put five in the room instead of eight. I should have put all eight, but I thought it's going to be, how, I mean, how big is this cabin that there's like, you know, 15 people in one small room? So I've made it down just five. Um, and so they were taking shots. They took, um, they took the priest down pretty low. They, take, they took Varya pretty low. I mean, by that point, they were both pretty low in their health. And Arthur hadn't yet even come into the fight, but... Pavel had also turned into his beast, and he was starting to go down in his health there too. So they they, had, they took some damage. It wasn't it wasn't that they were totally hurt or they were totally destroyed, but they weren't also fully healed either. But by this point, then they had started to deal with the. I think that the, the thugs were still all alive. But they had turned all of the zombies and they had killed the cultist. Um, and then Arthur comes around the the, the to the window and he shoots. And I ruled it that it was a sneak attack because the creature, I shouldn't have done that, but Arthur never gets to sneak attack and I wanted him to gather the opportunity. So I said, all right, yeah, so it's a sneak, he's just a surprise. He doesn't know you're there. And he was like, great, that means I get advantage. And I was like, yeah, that's true. You get advantage on that shot, sure. And he rolls a natural 20. So he crits and does eight D6 and he fires the silver bullet. So he does eight D6 or whatever it is, twice the dice for his level, which I think is four D6 at his sneak attack. Because he has the level, he rolled a talent a couple times. So he, yeah, he does a bunch of damage on his sneak attack. It's 4d6 already, and he get doubled it. So he's 8d6 sneak attack. He did like 31 damage. Um, that would have killed the werewolf outright, even if everybody else had done nothing. So I describe how, you know, the silver bullet Im impacts and just the creature shrieks and falls dead. And it was a super cool moment for Arthur. He was like, yes, I never get to do that. That was awesome. I just did 31 damage. That'll kill almost anything in one shot. Like, that's amazing. And... The beast, Pavel, the player who was playing Pavel, was like, yeah, dude, that's awesome. And he was like, my cool moment of me as a werewolf fighting a werewolf is totally taken by this. All of my damage, it was totally pointless, because that would have killed the werewolf. I mean, he knew that that would have killed the werewolf outright, even if he had done zero damage. And Varya had, had done this really cool moment where she was like, I need to do magic damage to this thing to kill it, so I am going to use my curse, because she's the cursed knight, and she's never done it before. And so it's a really key moment. It's like an important thing for her to do it, and she did it, and it also was similarly useless, because that... Great. So it was an awesome moment for one character at the expense of two other characters, and I think... I mean, it's just the way the dice roll. You roll a crit. You didn't have to roll a crit. Um, sneak attack probably would have killed the guy anyway, but at least it wouldn't have been, like, overkill to the point where they didn't need to do their turns. But anyway, it's, what, it's the way the dice roll. So it was kind of an interesting fight there. They killed the werewolf quickly, and then it was just a slaughter, a mop-up. I kept the fight going because um, damage does matter in this, because you got to take a whole a long rest to get your health back. Although they have a priest who can cast healing, and that gets a lot of your health back. Um, and you can do some con damage and maybe some stress or whatever. So, But none of that... Um, None of that mattered. They, they killed the other cultists really quick. I kept rolling morale for them, and they kept rolling really high. It was like the only time they were rolling well. Actually, they rolled pretty well in their shots. They were doing some damage. But then they were all dead, and um, and then the fight was over, and I just called it right there. They had found Irina. They had untied her. Um, Arthur had done that. Was, that's what he was doing for the first few rounds. He was in the other room untying Irina. So they had 
rescued her, and then that was the time. So, because um, we were already been playing and players were tired and getting sick, and they, I was like, okay, this is not, the tone is not good. I want to end right here on the end of a. What I should have done, again, is I should have ended before the fight. They should have approached the cabin and ended. And it would have been a less than ideal session. It would have been shorter. It would have had a weird tone. It wouldn't have been super fun. But, and they wouldn't have had that combat that at least one of the players really wanted. But then I could have made the fight a really important fight. I could have made sure it was dangerous and it made sense. And I could have fixed a couple of things that I kind of let fly uh, on, the, on the side. And, and then next session, it would have been a cliffhanger. And then the next session, they would have come in, had the fight, and then had, it would have been a strong opening. Right, uh, which is the, uh, the lazy dungeon master always want a strong opening. It would have been a strong opening, and then they would have also had time to talk to Irina and figure out what's going on and make their plans. And as it was, they're going to have to do that at the beginning of next session, which is way less interesting. So it was just an off session in everyone's point of view. Now we're going to play at least one more because they were like, "Well, what do we do? Do we go and try to stop the ritual in the castle, or do we try to find the people and warn them, or do we try to get out of here?" Do we go back and try to free the Vistani? Do we help Madame Eva? Because they had found out about her um, enchantment. They're like, we need to wake her up because we get information from her. So they have options. And next session, they're going to discuss those options. And that'll be kind of a cool role-playing in character with Irina there. You know, They'll probably berate her and correct her. At least a couple of the characters really don't like her at this point, And a couple of them feel more sorry for her. So um, I'm not sure how well I've done the sympathetic thing for her. I mean, I think they, un they, they believe her as a character but not a lot of them like her. Um, especially because, you know, she's caused this... As one of the characters said, everyone in, in Barovia is dead. I mean, all the people in that town that we left behind, Ismark, and all, they're all dead. You guys know that, right? And they're like, yeah, probably. And so they're blaming Irina for that. They're like, yeah, because if she hadn't run off, that wouldn't have happened. And so that, that might be true. Um, so anyway, what am I going to do for next time? Well, I'm not sure I have to prepare much for next time. I know the town... And I think they're going to go, whatever it is, they're either going to go back to um, Velaki. Not sorry, Velaki. They're going to go back to the Zerpool camp. I think they will, in fact, because they want to go back to Madame Eve. That seemed to be the consensus, that we need information, and Madame Eve is the one to give it to us. But she's in this trance, so we need to go back and, and re wake her up and find a way to do so. So I think next session will be waking Madame Eva up. And then by that night... Um, then they will see the, the, the dead rise or the spirits rise up to the castle and uh, the, the ritual that binds Barovia will be complete and Strahd will be uh, returned at least in some form. Uh, but they, the, but they, oh, they did hear one thing when they were talking. The reason that the cultist was here was that he had come to take Irina and the werewolf was saying, no, she's mine in a creepy way. Uh, and so the, the cult was like, no, we need someone of the blood. We need someone, we need one of the heirs, is what he said. Um, so they know that something like an heir is needed. Someone of the blood is needed. They don't know what that means. Now, of course, Irina and Ismark are descended from one of the heroes that killed Strahd. So that's what that he means. But the players don't know that. But as, by the way, are Arthur and Ulysses. They're descended, in fact, as, as we figured out, they're descended from Strahd's uh, niece, essentially, right? His, his brother's daughter. His brother's daughter by his wife, right? Um, Tatiana and uh, Sergei. So it's a, it's a big, it's a big uh, hint that they've gotten. And uh, I think one of the players caught it, and they're like, hmm. But we'll see if they remember it. And we'll see what goes on. So anyway, I have um, I have this ritual that's being conducted, and it's across the uh, in the northern part of the wood. That's going to be happening. The players are going to be able to find that and kill the Salaman and the uh, the, the hags, the, the hags' daughters, who are currently doing a ritual around it. They will find them, and they, they can find them and destroy them, and then the ritual will be stopped, and uh, Madame Eva will awaken, and. Uh, <clears throat> So, if they can do that, um, so I think next session probably they'll return to the Zare pool camp. Now, it's also possible that they're going to try to find Ismark and warn him, but it's already in-game about 4 o'clock, and by the time they find the road, it'll be late and dark, and then it'll have to go, and it'll be even later and even darker, 
will they be able to find them? Uh, and will they travel at night? I would suspect no. I suspect they'll go back to this airpool camp. Um, but you never know because they're now they're now pretty exhausted. They're now some of them have taken uh, a lot of stress damage. Some of them have taken a lot of physical damage. Um, so we'll see. We'll see about uh, the the path going forward. But for the moment, um, I think I'm pretty much all prepared because I know what will happen if they go back to the Zerpool camp. I have the NPCs and I have the fights, and I know there will be werewolves there and perhaps some cultists who will come again late to try to take. Uh, but I think mostly it's going to be um, werewolves. And now they have. I, now I know they can handle their handle themselves, so they can face two or three werewolves. And I think that's what will happen. Luvash and then a couple of the other werewolves will be there. And. Uh, when they come back to camp, if they go back to the camp. And uh, I know that one of the players wanted to kind of raise the Vistani in rebellion or something like that. So I think we'll see. Once once Strahd's returned, the Vistani are not going to actively act against him. Not even with Madame Eva's um, return. They'll be protected and they will be neutral. Um, so anyway, that's what our last session was like. A uh, mixed session, probably the most mixed of all of our sessions so far in terms of the amount of fun I had on it. Certainly it wasn't bad, but it wasn't the, I mean, it was probably expectations. I was hoping for this big, like, okay, they're going to go to the Vistani camp. They're going to um, find out about what's going on and then they spend some time there and then they're going to be accosted by werewolves and by this whole cult who demands Irina back and all this stuff. And, and then just the way it went, um, I had to change things on the fly. And I, I, I often just go with, you know, how what things feel like in the moment. It's just my style of DMing. And it, uh, it often means that sometimes things go really cool. And in the moment, I get that really cool result. And then other times, it means things are a little bit more haphazard. And they don't work out so well. And I think this was the latter case. It didn't work out so well. So anyway, that's sort of a campaign update, um, number eight. I thought this was going to be the end of season one. But I think that'll probably be next season, or next episode, <laughs> next next uh, session. And uh, I think we'll have nine episode seasons. Um, and at that point, I would imagine one of the players, especially if he does, in fact, defeat his werewolf maker, because I think Luvash is the werewolf who made him, um, then he will, uh, I could see Pavel dropping out. But we'll see. I'll have to boost Luvash's strength, too. I think I'm going to at least double his hit points and maybe give him some other abilities, because werewolves are, are, are strong, in, in um, Shadow Dark, but they're not that strong. So I need to make them a little stronger. All right, guys. I hope this has been interesting. Uh, I'll see you in another video.